as a professor, one of the questions I get all the time that that I both appreciate and kind of irritates me is, well, why do I have to take this class? Why do I have to learn this information? Why do I have to do this? And, and my initial response is always, in you know, in my mind, uh, because it's important. Why would you even ask me that? What kind of question is that to ask somebody who studies this, you know, as a as a as a profession? But, but then I, on second thought, I think, well, I think it's good that people ask, why do we need to know this? What's the purpose of this? So, um, so I'm really excited to talk about this as it relates to um, our beginnings of discussing intercultural communication. So let's take a minute to, to think about why do we study intercultural communication? Uh, why would this be important? Why would this be helpful? Okay. Um, and we're going to start at the very beginning, though, actually, instead of the why, we're going to start with actually the what and talk about what is intercultural communication. It's very simply communication between people from two different cultures. So you have people from two different cultures, at least two different cultures who are communicating and you have intercultural communication, right? Simple enough. And oftentimes we think of intercultural communication as taking place between people from different countries who live in, you know, from different countries. And that's true. People from different countries often do have different cultures in big ways or small ways. Their, their cultures may be very different, um, but that's not the only places that culture exists. Uh, differences in culture exist. It exists uh, right within our community and even within our own homes. There are different cultures, as we're going to discover as we study intercultural communication. The culture exists in, in very much local levels. It exists in wider circles. It exists all over the place and all over the world. And uh, so so just understand that anytime you have people who are from two different cultures, whether that be significantly different cultures, massively different cultures, or just slightly different cultures, you know, somebody from the next town may have a different culture than you, um, then that's intercultural communication. So this is something we we uh, we engage in virtually every day of our lives, engaging in intercultural communication. Um, so um, that's what we're going to take a look at. Um, and that's what we mean by intercultural communication. So why do we study this? Well, there are really six imperatives or reasons for studying, uh, for, for wanting to increase your intercultural competence, right? So ICC stands for intercultural competence, which is how we kind of gauge the effectiveness of and appropriateness of our intercultural communication. So there, there are six imperatives or reasons that we can look at for why we should care about this and why we should seek to expand our intercultural competence. Starting with peace. I mean, just very simply, we, we live in a big world and there are lots of other people. We need to coexist with these other people, right? Unless you literally are going to live on a desert island somewhere and never see anybody again, then you need to learn how to live with other people. It's just as simple as that. Um, and, and when it gets down to it, the easiest way to get along with other people um, is, and again, even if you don't agree with them, uh, it, but the easiest way to get along and, and coexist in a literal sense, be able to live near or, or around other people is to get to know what they're about and who they are, right? And the more you know about them, the, the easier it is to see them as people and not as, as some you know, stranger or some foreign or some alien, whatever. Uh, it's easy to see them as human beings. Right. And that's going to help us get to know them and, and appreciate them as individuals a little more. I, I think sometimes about uh, going to visit my grandparents farm in northern Michigan and they had cows there and other animals as well. But I would, you know, walk around with my grandpa and, and different people on the farm and say, you know, grandpa, what's that cow's name? And he'd say, well, that's number 96 or 2104 or whatever. And I would say, OK, but but what's the cow's name? And he said, well, then it doesn't have a name. That is its name. The name is you know, 2104, whatever. And I said, but don't you call it like Gussie or, or Betsy or whatever? And he said, no, we don't really name them. And I said, well, that's kind of, why don't you name them? He said, well, they're not pets. That's the thing. They're not, they're not our pets. These are, you know, part of our, they're part of our farm and we care for them. We, we raise them, we take care of them, but, but they're not our pets. Uh, and if we were to name all of them, it would be harder for us to do what we need to do when the time comes, if they're no longer producing and we have to get rid of them to make room for a different cow or we need to you know we're selling them for beef or whatever selling the whatever animal it is for um for you know as part of our livestock um trade then then that would be harder for the head name so we don't really think of them as uh, things like that we think we care for them and we want to raise them well and things but we don't uh, we want to be kind to them but we don't name them in that sense and and i started to understand that more as i grew up i grew up in a farming community as well so i started to understand that more that you know cows we think of cows as these cute cuddly creatures and things but in reality 
they're, they're a product for these folks. So, um, it makes it easier to, um, get, do what we need to do with the cows if we don't really get to know them that well. And the flip side is true. Uh, well, they're really the same thing, but, but in reverse operation with other people, the more we get to know other people, the more we will appreciate them as individuals, the more we will hopefully understand them and, and be able to coexist with them. Again, it doesn't mean we have to approve of their choices or like the same things they like or whatever, but we can see them as people, as humans and start to appreciate them as you know, individuals. And, uh, and that will make it easier for us to, to coexist in a sense, oftentimes. So, so if only for the sake of peace, um, we should study intercultural communication and seek to improve our intercultural competence. We also do so for demographic reasons, right? Um, demographics include things like, you know, the age and generation and race and ethnicity and all these different types of categorizations that we have um, for people in the way that we see the world. So just understanding the world in a demographic sense um, is another reason. It's another imperative for improving our intercultural communication because there are lots of different types of people. I mean, we exist across all spectrums of, of demographics, right? And in the United States, sometimes we call the United States, you know, the melting pot, right? But in, more recently, people have started to say, well, we're not really a melting pot so much as a as kind of a toss salad, right? When you melt something, it kind of all goes together and you can't tell one thing from another. But that's not true in the United States. We have very distinct cultures within the United States. So not only do we have people from, you know, again, other countries and other parts of the world coming in and, and creating very distinct and vibrant and interesting cultures um, within the borders of the United States, but even just, you know, if you, even in a more elementary sense, there are different cultures within the United States in the South, as opposed to the Northeast, as opposed to the Midwest, as opposed to the West Coast and the Northwest and so forth. We have different cultures. We're not really all one thing, right? And that's part of what makes the United States so interesting and, and so unique. So the, the, you know, when you have a tossed salad, all these things aren't just kind of being boiled together, melted together. A tossed salad has different ingredients and they all have different flavors and it all comes together and they, they work well together, but, uh, and it works out, but it's not the same as a melting pot, right? So we're not so much a melting pot here in the United States as we are a tossed salad. So we need to be able to communicate interculturally because there are people who aren't like us within the United States or within our neighborhoods and within our communities. And so um, there are different demographics. And so we need to appreciate that and be able to communicate with people across uh, those demographic boundaries as well. There's also an economic imperative, right? Um, very simply, there, I mean, if we want to get, come at this from a very, a very pragmatic sense, there is an economic imperative, an economic reason that we should uh, improve our intercultural competence. Quite frankly, the world is shrinking. Right? It used to be that you did business in your little community and that was it. That is no longer the case. Right? We do business. If you, if you were in a business, no matter what business you're in, you're likely communicating with and doing business with people all over the country, all over the world, potentially. And so there's an economic imperative to get to know other cultures and to be able to communicate with people across these cultural um, boundaries, right? Because if you want to make money, you're going to have to interact with people from different cultures and be able to appreciate that and be able to do that effectively. So there are with globalization, this mass globalization of economies, there is an economic imperative, an economic reason for each of us to improve our intercultural competence as well. Uh, next, we could look at the, the technological um, imperative behind intercultural um, communication competence and why we should improve that. Um, we live in what, um, you know, we, again, in an increasingly shrinking world because of technology in particular. Even if you never meet people or face to face, you are, you are likely in contact with people from different parts of the world, different parts of the country uh, who have very different cultures from your own. You probably run across them online again, whether it's through, you know, for, for economic reasons or for just personal reasons or whatever technology has created a shrinking world. And in a sense, what Marshall McLuhan referred to as a global village, right? We are more interconnected now with people from thousands and thousands of miles away than we ever have been before. And so there is a technological imperative for that reason, for us to uh, become more uh, interculturally competent, competent, because we are more likely to uh, engage with people from different cultures. Uh, at the same time, we also have to recognize that there is a digital divide that has been created as a result of this, right? People that have access to technology and are able to, to learn about that technology and, and how to use it and how to access it. 
and those that don't. And that creates its own cultural separation as well, this digital divide. So um, we need to appreciate that and understand that as well and be aware of it. Speaking of awareness, um, another imperative for intercultural competence is to, uh, very simply just self-awareness. You know, we need to know ourselves. We need to be able to, um, to understand ourselves and understand where we fit within the world uh, and in our community, what we bring to the table, what we need from others and all kinds of things like that. Just being aware of who we are and uh, what we bring and what others bring and, and, and how we fit together is really, really important. So that self-awareness is critically important. Um, it's also important for us in the sense of being able to avoid um, negative impacts of, you know, intercultural communication, things like ethnocentrism. Right. Ethnocentrism very, very simply is thinking that your culture is inherently better than uh, somebody else's culture. Right. Not just different than. And that's the that's a key difference. When we talk about culture. We're not talking about good or bad or right or wrong. Typically, we're talking about um, uh, different than. Okay? So somebody's culture is maybe different than yours. But ethnocentrism is where we fall in this trap of thinking, well, mine obviously is better than yours. My culture is superior to yours. And that's dangerous. We want to avoid ethnocentrism. And that starts with self-awareness, um, being aware of, of our culture. And that doesn't mean we can't take pride in our culture, but we ought to first understand our culture and understand uh, how it fits in the world and how it may be different than others um, and not better or worse, but just different, right? So you need to understand, again, as I said, ourself and our place in society and just, uh, just in general, how all of this fits together. All this kind of, uh, this kind of feeds into very closely to the ethical imperative, the final one here, the ethical imperative for, for intercultural communication competence, right? Or any cultural, uh, intercultural competence is, is for ethical reasons, right? Um, we can think of intercultural competence almost like an ethical uh, compass, right? That's kind of like our moral compass. Um, now, this doesn't mean that we should look at culture as as uh, determining you know, good or bad. It's not. One culture is not good and the other one bad necessarily. And it's not necessarily a matter of right or wrong. It's just a matter of different. Right. And we ought to understand those differences, but also what those differences mean. We look at things, you know, recently the, the a term that has come to light and been used a lot is privilege, for example. This idea of privilege, whether it's racial privilege or, as we talked about before, technological privilege, that digital divide creates that technological privilege as well. But whatever kind of privilege um, we, we have or that we are lacking, um, we need to understand that those things exist, right? That they are inherent within a culture. Some people are going to have advantages that others don't, right? Um, and, and, and those may be uh, created by society. They may be created by, for, by other um, things, but for, you know, however that comes to be, there are situations, always a situation which one person will have probably some privilege, some advantage inherent to, to the, to the, um, the process uh, over other people. And so we need to recognize that and understand you know, the ethics of that as well. So, so privilege certainly falls into this category of eth an ethical imperative, uh, which is one we've been examining as a society lately. There's also the, the conversation of relativist versus universalist perspectives, right? So a relativist perspective is basically says that, uh, you know, on the extreme end of relative relativism says that all perspective is unique and valid, that everything is good. What you believe is great. What I believe is great to the, to the extreme, right? Universalist perspective says, no, there are fundamental absolutes, you know, and we're certainly seeing a lot of that in our society uh, today in a, in a contemporary sense, the people that just say, nope, these are, there is right and there is wrong. And I, my culture is in the right here and yours is in the wrong. And the truth is, frankly, there's, there's a middle ground there somewhere. Uh, are, are there, are there, is there room to say that, that all perspectives are, are unique and valid? Certainly there's, there's, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, an argument to be made for that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, are there maybe some things that, you know, I think as a society and as a, you know, uh, globally, we would probably agree that, uh, that murder just for the sake of murder is, is wrong. Right. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we engage in wars and things and that's, that's different. We don't call it murder, but, but murder for the sake of murder, cold blood murder is wrong and that we should protect children and the elderly, right? There are things that we, 
probably all agree that are absolutes. Um, but not everything is an absolute. We can't just identify, we can't just determine that for every culture. So, so we get somewhere in the middle here of this relativist and universalist uh, discussion. And, uh, and while there are extremes to that, um, we need to recognize from, from an ethical perspective um, that, that there are different perspectives to things, right? People can see things in different ways. And so we have this ethical imperative or ethical reason that we need to improve our intercultural competence as well. So these are the things we're going to look at as we study intercultural competence and, and seek to improve our intercultural competence by studying intercultural communication, right? Because the truth is we are all connected. We were all connected in some way, you know, those, that, that famous that game, you know, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, right? Where you can connect any actor to Kevin Bacon in, in, within six links, right? And the same is true for pretty much everywhere around the world. We can all connect to one another, if not directly, then probably in short order to, to, to everybody pretty much around the world. Um, and it, it won't, won't, wouldn't take as many links as you might think it would. And because of that, because we are in an increasingly shrinking world, it is incumbent upon us and imperative for us to increase our intercultural competence through the study of intercultural communication. A few questions about any of these imperatives or why it might be important to study intercultural communication, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. Uh, in the meantime, though, I hope this has helped you understand a little bit clearer why this is an important topic and something that is worthy of our time and our attention.